Good morning, Manifest. I hope you've all had a wonderful week and a wonderful summer and are almost done the mad scramble to get the kids ready to be sent back to school. My summer has been jam-packed with busyness. First of all, I worked like crazy in July and only had about four days off. And then we rushed straight to Moose Jaw for a wedding, which I was the MC. Heidi was a bridesmaid and Chloe and Sophie were the cutest little junior bridesmaids. Okay, proud, proud dad moment here. Aren't they adorable? It was a beautiful wedding. Congratulations, Amy and Sheldon. Then we had a few days to chill with the family before we headed back home. Once back home, we did some renos, played some games, watched some movies, and enjoyed the weather. It's always great to be able to find time to relax, kick back, and well, do nothing. I don't watch a lot of movies. Sorry, Tom, but I do okay enjoy them occasionally. With that being said, I thought I could suggest some movies that you should check out, except being me, I'm gonna ruin them by using one word added to the title. Fun stuff. Okay, here we go. You can check out Pillow Fight Club. You know the first rule of Pillow Fight Club? You don't talk about Pillow Fight Club. And the second rule of Pillow Fight Club is, <laughs> who am I kidding? I don't know the rules to Pillow Fight Club. Or you could watch The Lord of the Onion Rings, an interesting documentary on which fast food joint has the best onion rings. Or maybe, you'd want to watch Zoom, Interview with a Vampire, starring Tom Cruise. We all know the frustration of Zoom by now, and now vampires do too. Or what about Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Kidney Stone? Life after Hogwarts has its drawbacks. Or maybe Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and the Wardrobe Malfunction, starring Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson. Enough said. Or maybe Tom Die Hard Boiled Egg, a new Christmas cooking show with Bruce Willis as John McMuffin and Alan Rickman as Hans Grubby. Little known fact, this was Alan Rickman's debut cooking show. Or one for the kids, How to Potty Train Your Dragon, an obvious sequel now that there's baby dragons to train. To train. Or Tina Turner and Hooch, a musical about a detective and his trusty canine sidekick. What about Purple Rain Man, starring Dustin Hoffman as Prince? And last, you could check out The Tax, Return of the Jedi. In a galaxy far, far away, nothing is certain except Sith and taxes. It's crazy how one word can make such a difference. And so I want to try something with you this morning. In the comments, say one word that Jesus has been reminding you of this week or maybe the one word that you need to hear from him. Let's focus on him, his grace, and his love for us this morning. Welcome to Manifest. Hi Manifest Kids, Mr. Stephen here. I am so glad that you decided to join us today. And guess what? You just finished reading chapter three of Ephesians. You are halfway through the book of Ephesians. So good job. Oh, it's, it's going by so fast. And you know what? A few weeks ago, I got to meet up with some of you and your parents at a park and I got to talk to you about, are you doing this challenge and how it's going? And it was so encouraging and so exciting to hear that you are doing it. You're reading through the chapters and I got to hear what some of the light bulbs and some of the things that are standing out to you and what God is, Jesus is talking to you about and what he's showing you as you read through this. And that was really encouraging because I record these videos and Miss Shauna records these videos, but we don't get to hear back from you as we talk and as we record them. So we don't know, are you doing them? Is anybody doing it? Maybe it's just Miss Shauna and I reading them and coming up with our light bulbs and question marks and arrows and nobody else is. But that's not true because I know that you are. And it was really awesome and exciting to hear that. I, there were some of your light bulbs and things were standing out to you were different than what mine were. And it was super cool to learn from you. And I hope I get more of an opportunity to do that so that I can learn more from you. And hopefully you can learn something from me too as we explore what Jesus is telling us through his word together. So, so good. Chapter three, we just finished it. I wanna dive right in and share with you what I found. And maybe it'll be the same as yours. Maybe it'll be different. So here we go. Light bulbs, things that stood out to me. Well, 
What stood out to me in chapter 3 was God's mysterious plan. Oh, remember Paul in chapter 1, he kind of hinted at this mysterious plan that God has revealed to his people, to those who believe in Jesus, who believe that Jesus is their rescuer. He has revealed his mysterious plan that he had from the very beginning of the world, a mysterious plan that he hasn't revealed to anybody, but now he has. And we who believe in Jesus, we've been shown what this mysterious plan is. And Paul kind of unpacks, what is that plan? And he says, the plan is that God wants to pour out his riches, his gifts, his blessings on everyone who believes in him equally. And that really stood out to me that this, I like the idea of a mysterious plan and that we know a secret almost. I think that's really exciting. But also this idea that God wants to share himself with everyone who believes in him equally. Not, not based on what we do or how good we are. Not this guy over here, he prays a lot. So he's going to get more and God's going to bless him more and do more for him than this person over here who is struggling and isn't praying. No, God wants to pour out and give his riches to all equally. And do you know what? That's not what I see when I look around. And I think that's why it stood out to me. When I look around at our world and, and things around me, sometimes I go, well, this person has a lot and this person doesn't. And that doesn't, it's not equal. But then the people talking about it say, well, this person should have a lot. They worked really hard and this person's lazy. And if they worked harder, then they would be fine. But that's not what the my mysterious plan sounds like. And sometimes the messages I'm seeing and the things I'm seeing is, well, this person's skin color is the wrong color, so they don't get as much as this person who has the right skin color. And that doesn't sound like God's mysterious plan, that all equally doesn't matter what color your skin is or where you're from or anything like that. Or if you're a boy or a girl, or things like that. So I think right now that's why that really stood out to me is that God's mysterious plan that sounds so good and it doesn't really fit with what I'm seeing around me. And sometimes even people close to me that I would expect to be talking about God's mysterious plan, it doesn't sound like they're talking about God's mysterious plan. They sound more like the way that I'm seeing the world around me, not equal for everybody, but not equal and so yeah anyway that was that was my light bulb and i think that's why that stood out to me was that mysterious plan and, and what it was and that we are a part of it so let's move on to question marks so questions that you might have for paul who wrote the letter or questions about something he said like why did you say that what does it mean maybe you're going to go back to the question that i encourage you to ask for every chapter is paul why'd you write this letter are there hints in here that tell you why he wrote it I think maybe he wanted to let the people in Ephesus um, and us know what that mysterious plan was, right? But for me, the question marks, the question that I came up with that I'm kind of wrestling with and puzzling over is right at the end of that section about the mysterious plan, Paul says, he kind of says why God has chosen to reveal this mysterious plan to us. And he says, he's revealed it to us so that his church, so us when we believe in Jesus, we're, we're his church, the people who are together and love one another and love Jesus, we're called his church, so the church would reveal and show God's wisdom. So he's let us know this plan so that the church is together and shows God's wisdom to, uh, let me get this right, to unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. My question is, who or what are those unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places? They sound interesting to me, sound a little ominous and scary, and maybe it has something to do with what I'm seeing in the world and why God's wisdom is shown in something that's very different than what we're seeing in the world and what we're seeing communicated between that unequal versus the equal. I'm not sure, but that's my question, is who or what are those unseen 
rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So I might poke around a little bit and see if I can explore that, or maybe you have an idea, and when I see you, you can tell me what Jesus is telling you that means. Um, but that was, why, that was the question that I came up with. So what questions did you have as you read through chapter 3? I want to know. What questions did you have? Why did you think Paul wrote this letter? Maybe you can let me know. Moving on. Arrows. Things we're going to do to apply this. It's not just a, hmm, that's really interesting kind of exercise or that gets me thinking and my brain worked hard and now I can take a break. No, what do we do now? Jesus wants to talk to us and he is talking to us through what we just read. What is he saying to us and what do we need to do with it? So for me, I kind of read through it a few times and something started kind of poking out and I think Jesus kind of started to unravel it and put some things together that I hadn't seen before and that led to my arrow or my takeaway, my thing that I need to do. So at the very end of that chapter, Paul has a prayer. But right before he starts the prayer, he talks about how we um, can boldly and confidently come into God's presence. So that was in the back of my mind. We can boldly and confidently come into God's presence because of what Jesus has done. So boldly and confidently come before God who made the whole world. Wow! We can do that with confidence, not out of fear going, he could hurt me. Because he could. But we don't need to be afraid because of what Jesus did. We can go, we can go right up to God and say, Dad, I'm here. And he's happy to see us. Um, but then in the prayer, Paul talks, he's praying. And I was looking at that prayer and going, do I pray this way? And it was interesting because he prayed. He said, it was a, his prayer I noticed was, it was big. It was a really big prayer. He prayed from, he prayed to God that he, God would give from his unlimited resources. So that word unlimited, whoa, never ending, unlimited. Not, oh, it's all out. Nope, just keeps coming, keeps coming. Pray to God for unlimited. And then the next, he talked about experiencing a love too great to understand. Can't even understand it, can't fathom it. It's going to blow your mind. That's, that's in that prayer. And then the last one that he said, God, would you do infinitely more than we can even ask or imagine? So I've read that last part, infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, going, well, even if I pray just this tiny little prayer, I'm still, God can do infinitely more than that tiny little prayer. Yeah, probably true. But look at how Paul started before he got there, was bigger than you can understand, unlimited and boldly coming into God's presence. So if I boldly come into God's presence and I say, God, I know you have unlimited resources. Would you shower out on me those unlimited resources? Or would you help this person over here with your unlimited resources? I want to feel your love in, in a way that I can't even understand. And then from that place and then do more, infinitely more, never ending more than I can understand or ask. Whoa, not more than I ask for this small thing. I'm going to ask for this big, huge thing and do infinitely more than that. I'm challenged by that. I think that Jesus is challenging me to do that because that's how big God is. I think I can go to God boldly and confidently and ask for that big thing and trust that he's going to do infinitely more than even that big thing instead of this Please, tiny little thing, don't hurt me. I don't know if that makes sense. That's kind of what I'm kind of learning and working on. Um, what arrows did you have? I hope that I get to meet up with some of you again and find out what some of yours are. Next week, starting right after these are over, you can start reading chapter four of Ephesians. We're getting so close. And Miss Shauna will join you next week to unpack what she found in chapter four. I'm enjoying this. This is fun. And I love you guys so much. And I'm so glad that you're joining me as we read through Ephesians together. It's been really good. And I can't wait to see what's next. So have an awesome week and we'll see you later. Bye. Hey everybody, 
It's Brad and I'm back from vacation, the longest vacation I've taken since we started Manifest six or seven years ago. Uh, it just wasn't possible in those early days. But this summer, I really felt like the Lord was saying, Brad, you need to come away with me. And, and I, I need you to step out of this for a long time and trust me with Manifest in the, in the meantime. So I did. And Oh my goodness, I, I just enjoyed my time with my family so much. And even with the smoke and even with some of the limitations, Shauna and I got off to Victoria for a couple of days. But the highlight of my vacation was the most incredible intimacy and encounters with God through the Holy Spirit this summer that I've ever experienced in my life. In fact, as I look towards the fall, as we look into the fall, I'm just sensing the Lord inviting us as a church to take a journey with him into what it means to live by the spirit. So if that's curious, if you're, that raises questions for you at all, if you're intrigued by that, or you know someone that might be interested in that, we're gonna take a journey together. That's It's gonna encompass life groups. It's gonna encompass what we do on Sundays, our video stuff online. It, this is what we're gonna wrap our hearts and heads around for probably an entire year. And as a result, Instead of just moving on, moving on to different material, we're going to sit in this stuff long enough so that we actually get it. So I can hardly wait. Uh, Jesus is just so good. His presence is so good. His power is so good. I can hardly wait to share that with you. Now, again, um, this, this bit about kind of teasing you and, and maybe raising some questions in your mind. Maybe you've been raised in, in places where the Holy Spirit wasn't talked about or you haven't experienced much of that or you've you've experienced the abuses of the Holy Spirit kind of theology in other churches and you're wondering where this all goes. Questions are actually really important in our faith. And I want to talk to you about that today. In fact, one particular question Jesus posed to a very specific person that has ramifications for us every single day. And I, I just want to point out, like I've done in the past, that the word question actually has the word quest in it. Question. In other words, every honest question can become a quest for a curious heart. Every single question we ask is important. In fact, I would actually say that our questions direct our spiritual life. Both, both the questions God has for us and the questions we have for God largely determine the direction that our spiritual lives will take. Now, I was Googling this week and I was, I was kind of curious. I thought, how many questions did Jesus ask? Because I know he asks a lot of questions. One website said 307 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 307 questions. Someone else said, I, I counted 337. Which, hey, of course, some of those are, you know, repeats or even three-peats because they'll appear in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like, you know, or one or two of those gospels, right? And so one person said, no, I think it's 170. 170 questions. And you can, you can see that in that number alone that Jesus loves to lead us with questions. So there's one particular question that he asks of a man named Bartimaeus in the New Testament. He's a, he's a blind beggar that is sitting beside a city named Jericho, begging for alms as travelers walk by, right? Just kind of like the people that maybe sit outside Superstore when you walk in or you meet them downtown on the side of the road, right? Or the, you're at a, a light and there's always the same guy there down on my luck. This is Bartimaeus and he's actually got a buddy. We're gonna, we're gonna find out about that later. But this is how the story goes. And I, I, want, I want to prepare you because this question can mess you up. This question Jesus asks Bartimaeus is so, it, 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 <laughs> it's gonna break your boxes, I can hardly wait. Okay, so here it goes. Here, here's how the story goes. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving Jericho, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, 
on your feet. He's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And here's the question. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. And the blind man said, oh, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. And immediately received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. What do you want me to do for you? Imagine Jesus asking you that question right now. In fact, I don't want you just to imagine. I'd like you to get a piece of paper out, maybe on your phone, whatever you need. Grab something near you, a blank piece of paper. I'm going to use this blue uh, card myself. And I want you to write at the top of the card, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And I, again, what I want you to entertain is this idea that Jesus is actually asking you that question today. He's actually asking you, what do you want me to do for you? Write it down. Come on, play ball with me. It's not a setup. This is, this is something you're actually going to need to do. Okay. Now, as you write that sentence, that question on that piece of paper. How many of you are saying, I don't know, this is a little too good to be true, right? It's a little too good to be true. You're writing it down going, okay, but I don't think that's actually how it works, right? The spiritual life, like maybe, maybe some of you are going, okay, yes, Jesus asked this question to this blind man in this situation, but that's the very specific context. And actually the apostle Paul says, and this is how God's will works in other places in the Bible. So we have to balance what Jesus said here with what, you know, this happens over here and over here and over here. I just want to point out that if that's how your brain is working, if as you're reading these words, you're immediately dismissing them by using other scripture that, well, first of all, that's what the enemy tried to do with Jesus when he tempted him, tempted him in the wilderness. He tried to dismiss what Jesus already knew with other scriptures that would lead him to misapply them. The other thing I want to point out is why would we try to correct the theology of Jesus? Like here's Jesus. He's saying these words to his blind man, right? What do you want me to do for you? Now notice Jesus doesn't pause in this moment and go, just a second, Bartimaeus, just hold that thought. Hey, everybody, this is just for Bartimaeus. So don't, don't jump to any conclusions because actually God's what He doesn't do that. He, he just lets it sit. And everyone's going, whoa, what's going to happen, right? Because there's a whole entourage with Jesus following him. And then, you know, decades later, when Mark records the story, he writes it down just like Jesus said. And he doesn't actually insert a footnote. By the way, what Jesus actually meant to say here, and, and if we're going to see it in the whole council of scripture, he doesn't correct Jesus, which is probably a good idea. And then probably a decade later or so, when Matthew wrote his gospel, he used Mark's stuff as source material. We know that because they're so similar. Matthew adds more than Mark. Mark Matthew's longer than Mark as a book, right? And so Matthew also doesn't add a footnote. By the way, this isn't uh, totally balanced theology. He doesn't try to correct Jesus. He just lets it sit. Just lets it sit. What do you want? That's the core of this question. What do you want? What do you want me, God, to do for you? So as I'm, as I'm speaking, I want you to take this note card that you've got. This piece of paper right on the top of it. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus is asking you that question. What would you, what would your answer be? What would your answer be? Now, don't make it too spiritual at this point, okay? In fact, it'll be more fun if you don't, okay? Just pick something you want, like even frivolous that you want. Just, just write it down. This is what I want. Jesus, this is what I want, okay? Because notice, he doesn't say, this is, uh, what do you want me to do for you? And it has to be within these parameters, he just gives him this blank check. And, and notice Bartimaeus doesn't go, no, no, Jesus. It's not about what I want. It's about what you want. 
Jesus would be like, oh. It's like when you when you go, you're, you're sitting around with your friends, right? And and you're getting hungry. It's around supper time, and you're going to go out to eat. You going to just, guys want to go out and get a bite? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, what are you what are you hungry for? Everyone's like, I don't know. Like, no, no, really, what do you want? I, doesn't matter to me. What about you? Doesn't matter. You pick. You pick. You pick. You're like, Phew. I asked the question. Okay, so so now why? Whatever. So then you're like, okay, Mexican. They're like, nah. Not Mexican. Oh, I just asked you and you just told me it didn't matter, right? See, there's, there's opposite extremes that we can fall into when it comes to this question. And, and imagining God asking us this question. One of them is the name it and claim it, the prosperity people that are like, it is about time. You know, as though God's entire mission in life is to, is to give me what I want, which of course is not true at at the level that that we're thinking about it, at least right here. This is not true. God's mission in life isn't like, how do I make Brad happy? That would really be something. Never mind the kingdom of God. I just wanted Brad to do well. You know, this is not, this is not really how it works. On the other side of the spectrum, though, we have people who think what I want doesn't matter at all. Doesn't matter at all. What matters is what God wants. That's what matters. But this question that Jesus asked Bartimaeus shows us that it matters at least some of the time. What we want. God cares about what we want. And by the way, this isn't the first time he asked this question. And just in case you're thinking, well, it's not like a blank check, (laughs) is it? Um, How about this? Back in the Old Testament, King David had passed away, he had passed the mantle of his kingdom to Solomon, his son, who was very young at the time. We don't know exactly how young, I don't think. But he's so young, he says, I'm just a child. And he's feeling really insecure. And God comes to him in a dream. And look at, look at this. This is how this plays out. The Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Again, notice he doesn't say within these parameters and considering that a balanced theology, he just asks the question. Blank check. Solomon's like, oh man, that's, that's a good question. And what does he land on? He says, I need wisdom. I need discernment. I have no idea what I'm doing in this throne. <laughs> Please help me. Give me wisdom. God's like, good answer, my man. And he gives him wisdom and he says, like, I'm going to throw in other stuff too, just to bless you because you chose such a good answer to the question, which means that Solomon actually got to choose. So this is not the first time that God's asked this question of a human being. What do you want? In fact, to make it even more uncomfortable for those of you who are more on the, we just need to surrender and what we want doesn't matter side. (laughs) Jesus actually took the principle of what do you want And he actually institutionalized it. He put it into a theology of prayer in John 15, verse 7, as he talks about how he is the vine and we are the branches and that we can bear much fruit. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Which means he wants us to articulate what we want. Now, the interesting thing here, and we're going to get into a little Greek. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't be too impressed by me. I looked it up on the internet. Okay, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm no different than you. I don't know Greek. I don't know Hebrew. But you can look up words and what they mean and how they're used throughout the New Testament. And as the scholars kind of reflect, this is, this is the word. When Jesus says, ask whatever you wish, he uses the word fellow. Thelo, here it is. Thelo is, is an amazing word. There's no verse, or sorry, there's no word in the New Testament, or sorry, I'm going to back up. There's no word in English. There we go. I'm mixing up my languages. There's no word in English that does remotely how much the word Thelo does in Greek. Thelo means to wish. It means to want. It means to will. And it actually includes the idea of pressing on to action. 
So we know what a wish is. A wish is kind of like, Ooh, it's like out there, right? Just something we, we, we kind of like, oh, I wish that would happen, but there's nothing really firm. It's very ethereal. And then a want is something that's taking on a little bit more flesh. And then when we will something, it's like we're choosing it. There's a volition there. And then pressing on to action. Fellow does all of that. It can refer to that entire process. So it's not referring to just fleeting little wishes. So when Jesus says, ask whatever you wish, he's saying, ask whatever you fellow to wish, want, will, press on to action. Those things you're committed to seeing come to pass in your life. Ask me what you want for what you want. Um, now, interestingly enough, this is also the same word Jesus used when he's talking to Bartimaeus. He says, what do you phalo me to do for you? What do you want? What do you will? In fact, when you look at the, the New Testament and you find places where it talks about the will of God, God's will is dot, 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 that's fellow. God has wishes. God has wants and desires. God has a will that he's pressing on into action. And we, as image-bearing creations, meant to stand in for him, body and spirit, in this world, as he fills us with his spirit, we have a thelo too. So cool, right? So now, he, there are some implications for this study that I want you to get your head around. And here's the first one. What you want matters to God. What you want matters to God. In fact, Jesus links what you want with successful prayer. And he says, it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples, in part by expressing your wants to God and seeing him answer them. Now, of course, this happens as we abide in him and his word abides in us. So there are some qualifiers there. But what you want matters to God, even if what you want is contrary to what he wants, that's still important. Still important. God values what you want. You may not always get what you want, but he values what you want. One of my favorite stories in the New Testament, is, it's so funny. It happens when Zechariah is, is in the temple. He's a priest and, and the angel Gabriel appears to him. This is a Christmas story. And, and Gabriel announces to him that even though he's an old man and his wife Elizabeth is an old woman, that she will give birth to a son and his name will be John and he will be the forerunner of the Messiah, the fulfillment of the ages coming to, to a head in the Messiah. And John will prepare the way for this Messiah as he turns the page of history and the kingdom of God breaks forth. This is John. And when he comes home, <laughs> he tells Elizabeth what's going on and what, what he saw in the temple, right? He's struck dumb so he can't speak, but he writes it down. And Elizabeth's reaction is priceless. She says, the Lord has done this for me. The Lord has done this for me. And, and just like it says there, as he though, Elizabeth... Has he really done this for you? Or maybe there's a bigger plan going on. Maybe there's something bigger than you happening in the world. But you know what? She's not wrong. She's not wrong. God is so big. He is so good. He is so glorious that he can work for the good of humanity while stooping down to meet our particular needs. And there was nothing apparently Elizabeth wanted more through her life than to become a mother, than to give birth to a child herself. And somehow God in his wisdom took this, the culmination of this plan of the ages and somehow meshed it with the desires of this old woman who had long since given up on her dream. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. The, the next implication of all this is that sometimes you want what God wants. Like as, as broken, as sinful, as selfish as we are, sometimes what I want and what God wants are the same thing, or at least they overlap enough that God goes like, hey, that's something I can work with. Third implication, the more God gets what he wants, the more we get what we truly want. 
especially in those places where our wants and God's wants, our thalo and his thalo overlap or share space, right? The more God gets what he wants, the more his will is done, the more good, pleasing, and perfect his will becomes in our, in our mind's eye because we understand what God wants is actually what we want deep down. I'm going to get to that in just a little bit. Some of you are going, I kind of want a Ferrari. Some of you are thinking, I want a girlfriend. That can't be what God wants deep down. So what are you even saying, Brad? I'll get to that in a little bit. Just suffice it to say, last point, that God is looking for people who want what he wants and are willing to trust him with what they want. To, to take what they want or what they think they want and lay it at his feet to make our lives about giving God what he wants, his thalo, his wishes, his desires, his wants, his dreams, his will, not my will be done, knowing that if God gets his way, I will actually get what I truly, truly want. Now, we understand, though, in this process, that many of the desires we're running with, many of the things, maybe the thing you put on your card was like, I want a, I want a girlfriend, really bad. I want, a, I want a Ferrari. I want, I want, maybe it's something just fun, right? Like, I, I'd really like a bigger house. I'd like this, I'd like that. Okay, so some of the things we ask for clearly need a little work, a little massaging, because they don't quite line up with maybe what God wants for us. What do we do then? Well, interestingly enough, the story I read you about Bartimaeus is from Mark chapter 10. And the corollary passage or a mirror passage, Matthew records the same story in Matthew chapter 20. And this, the, the story, the section right before they meet Bartimaeus, they're still walking along the road. They're approaching Jericho. Uh, the disciples are walking with Jesus. And one of their moms come comes and talks to Jesus about something. And she asks the very, very interesting question. And watch how Jesus interacts with her. The mother of Zebedee's sons, that's James and John, came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. Look at the, he asked, what is it you want? What is it you thalo? And she said, well, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right, the other at your left in your kingdoms. Like, I know you've got this heavenly thing going on and you're sitting on the throne in heaven. And when that day comes and you're seated back up there, just put John here and put James here and I'll be a happy. And, and you know, everyone else is like, really? You sent your mom to talk to Jesus. And James and John are like, well, last, we just remember the wine and the water thing. And, and he was like, woman, to, to his mom, you know, it's not my time. She's like, yes, but help them. And he's like, okay. So they were thinking maybe if our mom, came, you know, whatever, they're all kind of going, lame, lame. But look at this. She asks this question. After he asks, what do you want? It matters to him what she wants. And his response is, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. You think that's what you want. But the better question is, can you handle what comes with getting what you're asking for? Right? So Jesus is guiding her through this process and the disciples through a process of clarifying their desires. And this is what I believe God wants to do for us today. So... Uh, as we close, take that piece of paper, and if you haven't done it yet, please do it, because the next 10 minutes, 5 minutes, we're going to be walking through this. So um, write down, write down what you, uh, what you, uh, the question at the top, right? What do, what would you like me to do for you? And then your answer. I'm going to, I'm going to walk through a process where we're going to ask why, why, why three times, and as we ask those three questions, why, 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 we're going to get to the heart to the root of what we really, really want. For example, here's the card. What do you want me to do for you? All right. Um, let's say you put that down. You said, I want a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. Now I want you to picture Jesus asking you follow-up questions. Why questions? So why do you want a Ferrari? Now, <laughs> some of you are like, 
because it's a Ferrari. Like that, just that's that's the answer. And Jesus is like, no, no, why, why do you want a Ferrari? See, he's peeling back the layers and he says, maybe you say, well, it'd feel pretty amazing driving around. And he says, well, why? Uh, well, now we're getting somewhere. You say, well, people would, honestly, they'd probably stare. They'd, they'd admire me. And then he's going to ask, well, why do you want that? Well, I guess I want to feel important or significant or something. And I want you to notice that wanting to feel important or significant is a valid desire. God may not give you a Ferrari. That's probably not going to happen. But the desire beneath that desire is something that God has actually planted within you and he intends to fulfill. He's not going to go, no, I, I'm not imparting significance. I'm not giving you like a sense of importance. I'm not going to do that. Of course he is. This, in other words, here's a level at which what you want and God want are the same thing. What you really want is not a Ferrari. What you really want is to feel significant. And God wants the same thing. All right. Now let's say you did the girlfriend bit. You're like, I want a girlfriend really bad. Okay. So then let's, go, let's do it. Three layers deep. Why do you want a girlfriend? Uh, all my friends have one. Seem like a good idea. Okay. But why do you want one too? Um... Well, I'm lonely, I guess. Okay, so why do you want a girlfriend? <sighs> I want to feel wanted and loved. And now Jesus is going, now we're talking. Okay, so that, that's a valid desire. Does Jesus want you to feel valued and loved? Yes, what you want is what God wants. What you want actually matters to God. The problem is that we take these desires and we attach them to surface things as though the girlfriend or the Ferrari or the promotion or whatever it is, is the only way we're going to feel what we're feeling. And God's like, you don't know what you're asking. Just like he did with James and John's mom. And he's like, can I guide you through a process of understanding what you really want so that I can give you that? And in all of it, we don't shake this in God's fist. We understand, like we said before, the more God gets what he wants, the more we get what we truly want. Fact. Have you ever asked yourself why heaven is heaven? Of course, because we get to be with Jesus, because he is our ultimate desire deeper than that or beyond that, built on top of that. Heaven is a place where God always gets what he wants in such a way that everyone else who's in heaven also get what they truly want. There's not a bunch of people driving Ferraris and walking around with girlfriends in heaven because that's not what we really truly want. What we want is to be loved and to be secure, to be significant, to be known, to know others, to make a difference, and all of these things. This is what heaven will be made of. It's a place where we will realize once and for all that when God gets what he wants, I get what I truly want. So the best thing I can do is surrender what I want to this God who wants the very same thing. He just sees a bigger picture than me, knowing that if it doesn't happen, and now it will happen later. And this is why the psalmist can promise, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not the desires of your flesh, not your fleeting little wishes, but your deepest thalo. If you can peel back the layers of what you actually truly want, God's going to say, see, you and I, we want the very same thing, which means who better to trust your life with? 
And Jesus takes all of those desires we have twisted into shapes that they shouldn't be attached to, taking upon himself the punishment we all deserve for mismanaging our desires, for running after the wrong thing, the attitudes and thoughts of our heart that run contrary to the phalo, the will of God. He pays for all of that, clears the deck, says, let me give you a new heart that wants what I want. And let's try this again now with filled with my spirit, knowing that the best is yet to come. Amen. Oh, so now, now we have a chance to worship Jesus together, to lay our desires at his feet, to take what we want, surrender it to what he wants, knowing that what he wants is good. To the end, to 
Sounds a new beginning as distant hearts begin believing. Redemption's bid is unrelenting. Your love goes on. Your love goes on. Carry us, carry us When the world gives way You cover us, cover us With your endless grace Your love is relentless Your love is relentless Your love is relentless Love is relentless The time is up for chasing shadows You gave the world a light to follow A hope that shines beyond tomorrow Your love goes on your love goes on You carry us, carry us When the world gives way You cover us, cover us With your endless grace Your love is relentless your love is relentless Your love is relentless Your love is relentless Every chain you set us free Fighting for the furthest heart You gave your life for all to see Tearing through the veil of darkness Breaking every chain you set us free Fighting for the furthest heart You gave your life Your love is relentless Your love is relentless Your love is relentless Your love is relentless you Carry us, carry us Cover us, cover us you Carry us, you carry us You cover us 
Your love is relentless. Oh, thanks for joining us today. I'm so glad we could spend this time together. Hopefully we can connect in person. And if you haven't done that already, please lean in, uh, create small groups wherever you're living, working, playing. Also join us if you're able for our in-person gatherings on Saturday nights. And we would love to see what God does in your heart along the way as we take this journey this fall into what it means to live in the Spirit. Oh, Jesus, you are so good. You are so worthy. Thank you that for the joy set before you, what you truly, truly wanted, you endured the shame. You sat down at the right hand of the glory of God. And you say, follow me. In Jesus' name we pray, and we follow, and we love you. Amen. Amen.